So I want to talk a little bit about modeling population growth and then going into some basic community ecology. So when we're studying populations, once again, we're looking at how a member, how a group of members of a specific species are uh, reproducing, how the population is growing, how the population is shrinking, etc. And when we model growth, we use the letter N, capital N, to represent a population size. In lab, we, we often use a lowercase n, and the lowercase n is a sample size. So if you go out and measure 10 members of the population, then that's a sample size. But if you measure everyone in the population, that's the population size. The letter R indicates the per capita rate of increase. So how many more of that organism will there be next year for everyone there is this year. And to figure that out, you basically take the birth rates minus the, uh, the death rates uh, per organism. So if the rate of growth was zero, that would mean that next year there would be the same number of organisms as there are this year. So maybe 10 would die and 10 would be born. So if a population contains 10 unicorns and there's an unlimited habitat, so no uh, carrying capacity, no shortage of food or space, and let's say this population has the ability to double their population every year, which is, uh, so what I'm saying is for every individual there is now, there'll be another individual next year as well. So we'll grow, if there's 10 this year, there'll be 20 next year. Show how this population would grow in a 15-year period. For example, there are one unic there are I'm sorry. In year one, there are 10 unicorns. In year two, how many would there be? And as we said, what we do is we take that growth rate and multiply it by the current sample size. Uh, and the growth rate is one, and the and the sample or the population size is 10. So one times 10 is 10, and we add that to the current population size of 10. So next year we have. 20 unicorns. So you should practice that on this uh, figure here. I may have a, a question kind of like this on the on the final. It won't be an overly elaborate question, but a, a, a something you can do by hand uh, or interpret at least on the final exam. So to figure this out for year 20, or for, I'm sorry, for for for, uh, for year three, we start off with a population of 20 in in uh, year two. Uh, so you take 20 times 1 plus 20, and then you get 40. And then you take, you know, 40 times 1 plus 40, etc. And you can see that over time, the population grows and grows and grows and grows and grows, basically doubling every year. And if you graph this, you get an exponential growth curve. You see this in real life when you look at organisms that have ideal conditions or they're recovering from near extinction. So this is something we can see in real life. Bacteria in a petri dish full of nutrients or elephants recovering from near extinction if their habitat is still healthy. This is called a J-shaped curve. It shows exponential growth. Now in real life, uh, after a while, that's going to catch up to you. You cannot grow exponentially forever. And when we see a leveling off or a plateau of growth, we call this the logistic growth model, which is probably more accurate uh, in terms of what will happen to any organism over time. But uh, the logistic growth model is more complicated than the exponential model. So we're modeling here, just like with the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, we're modeling how a population may respond to a change. Uh, this is how we make predictions to test them then with, the, with experimentation. And the logistic growth model produces an S-shaped curve, uh, taking into account the presence of the carrying capacity. So in this case, we're going to say the carrying capacity is 2,000 unicorns, and other than that, everything is the same as the last example. So the way you calculate this is you start off with the growth rate, which is 1, times the population size. So we start off with a population of 10. So you take r times 10, which is 10 again. And then you multiply that by the carrying capacity 
minus the population size divided by the carrying capacity, as you can see in the example there. So you're getting a proportion of the current population out of the total carrying capacity. And then you add that, so 10 times that, that uh, calculation, so 10 times the carrying capacity minus the population divided by carrying capacity, and then you add that number to the current population. And then what we calculate then is basically we get 20 unicorns again. So 19.95 unicorns, we get 20 unicorns again, just like we did before. But once you do this over and over and over again, you, you get generation two, then you do this for generation three, etc. You should try this on your calculator. You end up with numbers quite different. Uh, you know, by the time you get to higher uh, population sizes, things start changing. It's quite different from our other example. Before that, the population change is pretty similar. But, af but as we get to higher and higher population numbers, things start changing. And what happens is population growth slows down as the size increases and plateaus at 2000. So we reach carrying capacity and population growth no longer increases. We can see that in this model here. So you should try those out. And of course those things that limit those population densities are things like density dependent factors. You can read about these in your text but things like predation, competition for resources, and stress things that slow down reproduction when populations increase. There are other factors called density independent factors that affect a population regardless of its density. So remember, population density is the number of individuals per unit area, and uh, it doesn't matter if you're a dense population or a less dense population. If the climate changes or an asteroid hits the Earth, it will still affect your population. Now the human growth uh, model uh, that we see here, you can see actual data on human growth. Uh, we see that J-shaped curve right now. We're nowhere near reaching the logistic growth uh, where we reach carrying capacity. Well, I say we're nowhere near. It's hard to say how far we are. It depends on how well we can keep up with feeding the world with agriculture and things like that. But the human growth uh, in the last a uh, thousand years or so has reached that exponential growth phase where it's climbing rapidly. Each, each year it, it grows and grows and grows. Now, the next chapter that we want to talk about is the chapter on community ecology, so the interaction of organisms with each other. And for this lecture, I just want to focus on the ways organisms affect one another. And interactions between organisms can benefit both organisms and when when that happens we can symbolize that with a plus plus meaning both organisms benefit a plus zero would indicate that one organism is benefited and the other is not affected and then a plus minus situation might be when one organism benefits and another one is injured and of course there might even be a minus minus situation but we won't worry about that for today so when you have two organisms benefiting it's a type of symbiosis known as mutualism. Mutualism is when one organism benefits and so does the other. So when a bee pollinates a flower, the flower is, is pollinated and the bee gets nectar. They both benefit. When fungi and green algae live together in a lichen, making a lichen, that is a mutualism. Uh, the, the algae gets a habitat to live in, the fungus gets uh, food to eat. Other examples include like this, this tree here with ants living in its thorns that they, they, they get a place to live and they protect the plant from invaders. Mutualism. So symbiosis is actually not equivalent to mutualism. Mutualism is a type of symbiosis. Symbiosis is basically referring to how the organisms are interacting with each other. And one way to do that is, is through a mutualism, a mutualistic relationship. Commensalism, this one's actually really hard to prove if it really happens or not. It's theoretically possible. So, uh, you know, here's an example of like this, this egret on the back of a cow. Uh, the egret isn't doing anything for the cow. The cow is not benefiting from this relationship. And the egret can see further across the prairie, maybe see predators coming or see its food in the distance or whatever. The cow presumably is unaffected. The egret gets a slight benefit. Possible case of commensalism. 
Herbivory, this is a plus minus situation. This is when an herbivore consumes plants or algae. So questions I could ask you on an exam would be, how have plants adapted from the selective pressures of herbivory? How has natural selection adapted them? And how have herbivores adapted to eating these plants? So one thing we might discuss is plants have evolved secondary compounds. These chemicals that we've talked about in the past, these extra secondary metabolites that maybe are, uh, are toxic or cause rashes and itchiness or even like THC in marijuana that would confuse uh, an herbivore and maybe keep it away in the future. Plants have also evolved uh, physical protection, thorns and, and, and uh, uh, you know spines, things like that, that, that deter organisms from eating them. And of course herbivores have adapted as well. Some herb herbivores can eat the secondary compounds um, and uh, they find ways around the plant defenses. Predation is another plus minus situation. This is when one animal kills and then eats another. And predator adaptations include teeth, claws, and venom as well as camouflage. Have a look at the picture on the lower left. And uh, you know the great white shark on the right there obviously a carnivore. So one animal is the prey, that's the animal that is eaten, and another is the predator, the one that's doing the eating. So adaptations from prey also include cryptic coloration like we talked about in our early lab on the, uh, the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. Uh, some prey become unpalatable, meaning they taste really bad. And what's funny is some of them become unpalatable by eating plants that produce nasty chemicals and then they store those chemicals in their bodies uh, to make them less palatable. So camouflage, um, tasting bad, uh, those are things that you can do. Uh, fighting back, of course, like with, with antlers or horns is something else, or running fast. Those are things that prey can do to try to escape from the predators. Now, evolution is pretty cool in that it can cause interesting uh, adaptations to form in, in uh, organisms. And uh, here's an example of a poison dart frog. We talked about its venom and what it does to the human nervous system recently. Uh, let me remember, I think it, it keeps sodium channels stuck open in the case of the poison dart frog. And they have something known as aposematic coloration. So they have a venom which they get from eating a, a beetle that produces the, the venom, or I should say a poison. Um, remember, a poison uh, is something that if you eat, you get sick. A venom is injected into you. So there's no such thing as a poisonous snake, but there are venomous snakes. So aposomatic coloration is a warning to predator that, that the prey has some kind of chemical defense. So, hey, don't eat me. I'm poisonous. I will make you sick. So we see this bright red coloration is often a warning sign not to mess with that organism. But uh, evolution also affects other organisms that take advantage of these things. Uh, so this is called aposematic coloration. Now let's talk about Batesian, or Batesian mimicry. Batesian mimicry is when a non-poisonous or a non-venomous organism mimics one that is venomous or poisonous. So for example, we have the eastern coral snake here, which is a venomous snake. But scarlet king snakes, like on the lower right, they mimic the color patterns of the coral snake. So that way, that way a predator who wants to eat the snake might think it's venomous and leave it alone. So once again, this doesn't happen because the snake wants to look like the uh, coral snake. Uh, you can imagine how genetic variation and selection led to this scarlet king snake evolving. There was variation in the population. Some of them had red and yellow and black stripes that were more like the coral snakes. They got eaten less because they looked like the venomous snake and over time uh, they're left alone. So the coral snake here is showing aposematic coloration, warning predator, predators that, that it itself is venomous, but then the uh, scarlet king snake is showing Batesian mimicry. It's, it's copied or at least sort of copied that coral snake's coloration patterns. Batesian mimicry also we can see here where there's a, a snake on the lower right 
Uh, and on the left is the butt of a caterpillar that mimics the head of a snake. Therefore, birds are less likely to eat it. Another plus minus situation is parasitism. Parasitism is different from carnivory or carnivorous animals or predation in that a parasite is an organism that feeds on a living host. Um, and there can be endo and ectoparasites. Endoparasites, like on the left, are tapeworms found inside the organism. They benefit from being in the organism while the, while the host, in this case, we call the, the, the organism a host rather than prey. The host does not benefit. It is, ac it is actually harmed by this relationship. And on the right, we see an ectoparasite, a parasite found on the outside of the host, like a tick. So I think that's enough uh, lecture for this online lecture. Um, we are going to talk a little bit about human impacts on the environment uh, for the last lecture of the semester. And then the final exam will include ecology. Um, probably ecology will be, there's only a few chapters, so I would assume ecology will be about 20%, 25% of the uh, final exam and the rest will be comprehensive.